Hello, my name's Tegwen Roberts and welcome to our Fagan Sheffield Pub podcast. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the early history of Fagans, formerly the Barrel Inn on Broad Lane in Sheffield. I'm going to look at the first records we have for the pub dating back to the early 1800s and the history of the area around it which shaped not only the pub but the people that have been part of its story. I'm also going to talk to a few people who've known the pub for a long time. This is part of a series of recordings that have been made recently celebrating the joy that is Fagan's and it really is a Sheffield institution. It's legendary as a music pub and it's been a hugely influential part of my life for the past 25 years, ever since I ventured in as a nervous student looking for a music session in the late 1990s and I know lots of other people that feel the same. I'm recording this in early February 2023 as landlords Tom and Barbara Balding have just retired after an incredible 37 years behind the bar. And anybody that knows Tom and Barbara will know that Tom has a wealth of stories about the pub. And before he and Barbara retired, some friends, Edwin, Dave Young and I, were lucky enough to record a few of those tales with Tom. And those are now on YouTube. Just search Fagan Stories Sheffield. At the same time, I'd done a bit of history research for another project, and I also started chatting to some of the people who've been part of the Fagans family over the past 40 years, many of whom I'm lucky to call friends. And so the idea for this podcast was born. I just wanted to say that this isn't intended to be a detailed oral history of the pub, but more of a way of recording and sharing some of its incredible stories, showing the love for the pub and its community, and marking a point at which one Fagans chapter is ending and another one is about to begin. So Fagans is a historic pub. It's soaked in stories. And having looked back in the archives, there are lots of parallels in how people have experienced and shaped the pub over the past 200 years. As Tom says, people make pubs, and that's certainly the case with Fagans, and something that I want to explore a bit today. So, before 1985, Fagans was called the Barrel Inn, and to understand the history of the barrel, we need to first look at the history of the area around it, which is a part of Sheffield that used to be known as the Crofts. The Crofts was a network of narrow streets around Broad Lane, Campo Lane, Solly Street and Scotland Street. The old street names around here evoke a quite rural environment, with names like Garden Street, Peacroft and Holliscroft. However, as Sheffield started to grow as an industrial city in the late 18th century, this area was a focus of intense speculative development, and larger Georgian properties were quickly hemmed in by densely packed, back-to-back terraced houses or tenements, often arranged around small courts and yards. These courts had very limited light and space, and the houses were often lived in by one or more families with shared facilities like water and toilets, which were in short supply. There was little or no sanitation and it was crowded and noisy, not least because the first residents had come from farming communities and often kept animals like chickens and pigs in the shared yards. There were also multiple cutlery workshops and metalworks of various sizes squeezed in between the houses, so you can imagine how busy and polluted this area would have been. This is something that Sheffield poet Ebenezer Elliot, the Corn Law Rhymer, wrote about in 1829, a time at which the barrel was already well established. Scenes, rural once, ye still retain sweet names, that tell of blossoms and the wandering bee. In black pea croft no lark its lone nest frames. Balm green, the thrush hath ceased to visit thee, when shall bower spring her annual concrete sea, or start the woodcock if a storm be near. But morning better days, the widow here still tries to make her little garden bloom, for she was country born. No weeds appear where her poor pinks deplore their prison tomb. The majority of the courts and back-to-back houses in the Crofts were demolished in slum clearances during the 20th century, and the area looks very different today. However, some of the early tenements do survive, often hidden in later buildings or where you don't always expect to see them. Fagans is a great example of this, and we'll come back to that shortly. As one of the cheapest parts of the city to live, The Crofts in the 1800s had a very mixed and often itinerant population, with immigrants coming from across Europe, including from Italy and Ireland. During the 1850s in particular, there was an influx of Irish immigrants fleeing the famine, and many of those who reached Sheffield moved into the Crofts. A new Catholic church, St Vincent's, was established on Solly Street, and the Sisters of Charity Convent opened on the corner of Broad Lane and Red Hill, just a few hundred yards from the barrel. Unsurprisingly, in an area where lots of people are living in very close quarters, brawls and fighting were commonplace. 
there were also lots of pubs and drinking. At that time, for the poorest in society, drinking beer in moderation was actually safer than drinking water. The Sheffield metals trades in particular had a reputation for heavy drinking, partly because of the hot and dusty working conditions. There was also a tradition in Sheffield known as St Monday, where certain metals trades, including grinders and cutlers, tended to choose not to work on Mondays, preferring to go to the pub instead. This was a time when most workers did a six-day week from Monday to Saturday, and Saturday was payday, with limited opening hours on Sunday offering little chance to spend your wages. Many of the metals trades in Sheffield were also self-employed at this time, which meant they could choose their hours. In his autobiography, Harvey Teasdale, a fascinating local character and theatre performer who did a lot of drinking in the Crofts, describes the growth of jerry shops in this area in the 1830s. These were basically houses where you could buy beer after the 1830 Beer Act permitted any taxpayer to brew and sell beer from their own home. Many of the pubs in this area had names that again evoked the more rural lives of the Crofts' first inhabitants, like the Green Seedling on Bailey Street, which I think is a brilliant name for a pub. So that's the backdrop. Imagine in the 1800s this network of noisy, busy streets full of people from different parts of the world, many of them living in these tiny, narrow tenements, squeezed up against steelworks and workshops, with dozens of pubs and basic beer houses, and that's the environment in which the Barrel Inn first appears. One man who knows more than most about the history of pubs in this area is Dave Pickersgill from the Sheffield Campaign for Real Ale, and he kindly agreed to talk to me for the podcast. My name is Dave Pickersgill. Um, I'm the Pub Heritage Officer for Sheffield District Camera and have been interested in the barrel, uh, now Fagans, Fagans since 1985. Um, I've been interested in the barrel since, well, I suppose I first came to Sheffield, which was uh, in the mid-70s. The history of the pub, the, if you go way back into the 18th century, the, the history of the barrel, as was then, as it became known, is a bit shrouded in mystery. Um, when the building was actually built, uh, nobody knows. It's sometime in the latter part of the 18th century. Possibly built as a pub, possibly not. Again, we, we don't actually know. You look at the layout of the building, it could have been a tenement that m- metamorphosized, changed into a pub. It, it could have been purpose built. What we do know is in 1815, it was owned by um, famed Sheffield brewer Thomas Rawson and Company. Thomas Rawson had a huge brewery on Pond Street um, on the site, which is now Sheffield Hamlet University. Um, Thomas Rawson's was actually bummed by the Luftwaffe in 1940. But in 1815, Rawson's owned the, what was then known as the Barrel. In Sheffield archives, there is um, a plan of the state of the pub at that time. Um, interesting to see, you, you go in, you've got the um, dram shot the little snug as you go in on the right you've got the bar where the current bar is that was part of the pub but on your left where the the current lounge is um, that is a totally separate um, building it's, it's actually a tenement in 1815 so you've got to imagine yourself in 1815 208 years ago time of Waterloo you'd be sitting in the tenement not in the lounge of the barrel towards the back of the pub on the right hand side that small room, yes, that was part of the pub then, but again, you look at the uh, the joins on the walls and the evidence that remains, and at some point, that was possibly a separate building. But again, it's hard to tell, we just don't know. But we do know that 1815, the current lounge, was a tenement building. Um, the history of the pub itself since then, it obviously prospered and thrived. It still exists today, so it's had it's got a history of, of well over 200 years. Um, had various landlords over, over the period, over time. Lots of stories, if you look in the books about the gang wars, look in the, the Sheffield Risings in the late 19th century, the bowel keeps getting mentioned, um, keeps popping up, things happening, um, music happening, uh, it's, music's happened in the in the barrel in for, well, yeah, well over 200 years for a lot of time. Can you tell me anything about what the pubs around there would have been like in 1815 when the barrel was on that plan and was drawn? Um, 1815, we're talking Waterloo, Napoleonic wartime, a time when Thomas Rawson the, of Rawson's Brewery was the Lord Lieutenant and at one point the Grenoside Beacon went and the Sheffield Regiment marched as far as Doncaster before they found it was a false alarm. So we are talking that, that sort of time, 200 plus years ago. At the time Sheffield would have been, or that part of Sheffield, would have been, I suppose, cramped tenements, poor hygiene, 
pubs or some of the pubs would have been the, the shining beacons in the streets, as it were, the sort of the, you know, the most comfortable seats, most comfortable rooms, so the place you get company, the place you go to for a bit of a bit of relief from life, I suppose. The pubs themselves in 1815, the barrel at the time it would have been very similar to other pubs in the area. Lots of you know at that time two two three small rooms, outside toilets. In the wider area, some of the pubs would have been slightly bigger, would have been purpose-built, but the vast majority would probably be, you know, beer houses, perhaps linked to a local brewery like Wilson's, you know, perhaps with their own brewing facilities on site. The major changes, I suppose, over the last 50, 60, 70 years, um, Rawson's were in the building, Rawson's were bombed by the Luftwaffe in 1940. Their pubs were finally taken over by another local brewer, Gilmore's, who had a brewery at Ladies Bridge, not the Tenants Brewery, separate brewery at Ladies Bridge, close to where the old Castle Market was. Gilmore's took the barrel over in the mid 1940s, early 1950s. Joe Fagan became the landlord, um, the ex um, Bomber Command Sergeant, who member of the Caterpillar Club. That's people who've parachuted from planes, aeroplanes, and survived. That was the last major changes in terms of decor, in terms of decoration and, and I suppose structural alterations. The bar extended slightly further back in the pub. Toilets became inside, out, out in the yard. So in 1950s, that's actually relatively early for inside pub toilets. So to recap, the barrel, now Fagan's, has been around since at least 1815. It was originally one of many small pubs in this area, but it's one of only a handful to survive, others including the grapes and the dog and partridge. As Dave said, it was owned at different times by two of the most famous historic Sheffield breweries, Rawson's and Gilmer's. It was later taken over by Tetley's and then Punch Taverns, and most recently Starbars, who were owned by Heineken. Over time, the pub has been expanded and the current building encompasses at least two, if not more, 18th century buildings. I love the fact that when you're standing in the lounge, you're actually in somebody's 18th century living room. It genuinely gives me goosebumps. It's also made me think about all the people that must have popped into the snug over the years with a jug to be filled up with beer and taken home. Fagan's is famous nationally and even internationally for its music sessions. In the time that I've known it, Fagan's has always had music sessions most nights of the week, apart from Thursdays, when the legendary Fagan's pub quiz takes place. Some of the musicians who've led sessions here include Morris Malone, Patrick Walker, Hugh Waller and many more. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a later podcast. But this musical history goes back a lot further. There's a long history of music and live performance in the pubs in this part of Sheffield. Some of it quite politically radical. Joseph Mather, a file cutter and troubadour dubbed Sheffield's Georgian punk poet, was born in the Crofts in a place called Cack Alley off West Bar Green in 1737. He wrote popular and often quite scathing satirical songs about the politics of the day and events of local interest, including the poor treatment of the working class in Sheffield, and sang them in pubs in this area from the 1770s to the early 1800s. There was also at least two generations of skilled musicians with visual impairments, known as the Blind Fiddlers, who met and performed popular tunes at a pub in Paradise Square called The Q in the Corner from the 1780s through to the 1840s. In the 1830s and 40s, Harvey Teasdale, a flamboyant theatrical performer who was born in Sheffield in the early 19th century, was also performing in illicit spouting clubs in the Crofts area. These clubs were meetings where people spouted or read passages from popular literature and plays, usually held in the back rooms of pubs and usually quite drunk and raucous events. By the 1830s, these sorts of meetings were considered politically radical and were borderline illegal, as they were seen as places where anti-government views could be expressed and shared. It's quite likely that T-Cell would have known the barrel, and it's possible that he drank and even performed here. Going back to the history of the barrel, as Dave said, before Tom and Barbara, the longest serving landlord was Joe Fagan, who the current pub name commemorates. He took on the lease on the 6th of July 1948, after being demobbed from the RAF and eventually retired on the 17th of September 1985, when Tom and Barbara took over. The pub was officially renamed Fagan's by Tom and Barbara in November of the same year. There may not have been the same level of organised sessions in Joe's time as there has been during Tom and Barbara's, but it was already known as a music pub, or at least a pub where you could have a tune. I spoke to Gina Lafoe, who started playing in the pub in the 1980s when it was still the barrel, and she told me more about what it was like. 
My name is Gina Lafoe and I'm a musician and I was one of the original residents of Fagan's Pub. I, I played there when it was the Barrel a long time ago. It was off the beat track so it wasn't full of people getting ready to go clubbing so a couple of friends at the time, Tom Smith who I played in Sheep Wee with and Mick O'Connor, that's where we used to end up. We could play till all hours and uh, when Joe went to bed the, the, there was the scrap lads that used to go there, I think, and they used to look after the bar and ask you, do you want a drink? And you'd leave your money there. They'd wash up and everything, leave Joe a tip. So it was a bit of a nice place to go, really, yeah. Gina's memories of playing in the pub until all hours after Joe had gone to bed reminded me of a story that I found in the British newspaper archive from 1917. It's often hard to trace things like sessions in the archives as they're quite ephemeral and they don't get documented in the same way as formal performances, which to me is part of why I love them so much. But in this case, the newspapers reported on a court case involving the landlord of the barrel in 1917, Matthew Rogers. The Sheffield Daily Telegraph reported that on the night of September the 22nd, four policemen raided the barrel inn and arrested 13 men from Rotherham, described as nearly all colliers, who were charged with consuming liquor on the licensed premises during prohibited hours. The article goes on to say that when the police knocked on the door, the men made a general rush for the rear of the pub and out into the backyard, where they were all rounded up and taken back to the house. All of the men said they were there to say goodbye to the landlord's son, also called Matthew, who was in the Navy and was going back to his ship the next day. In giving evidence, Matthew Jr. said that they'd had a pleasant evening and that his friends had stayed for a sing-song after his father went to bed. However, crucially, no beer had been served after 9.30pm. The judge acquitted all of the men, but fined the landlord for allowing alcohol to be consumed on the premises after hours. It sounds like it was a good party and I'd be surprised if it was an isolated incident, although perhaps they were just more careful not to get caught on other occasions. And we can trace the music back a few more years in the archives, because in the census records for 1911, another landlord, Albert Fiddler, who's part of another story that I want to tell you later on, was listed as living at the pub with his wife Dolly and their three children. More interesting to me, though, is that there are three other people living with them at the time. Edward Pettifer, who's listed as a barman, Agnes Golding, a domestic servant, and a boarder called John Fennell, who's listed as a vocalist. In pencil, the census enumerator has written public house next to his occupation. He's also listed as an employee, which suggests to me that he was making the main part of his living by singing in the pub. For over a century then, and very probably for longer, there's been a mix of informal and more formal music happening at Fagan's, and this continuity is something that makes it really special. It's certainly something that Tom and Barbara have actively supported, valued and curated during their time in the pub. Gina told me about them taking over the place and absorbing its atmosphere. I was only around it really when Joe's in his last time, last period there, you know, so it was pretty obvious he was going to move on. So when they took it on, I went there with Tom, in fact, a few times and we got drunk in there, you know, just to get the feel of the place. I think Daryl was with us and there was somebody else, I can't remember now, somebody that we, we both know, I can't remember. But it, what they did was they seemed to drink up in the atmosphere of it and when they'd absorbed enough, they fitted into the place and it fitted them, you know. That was one of the first things that the brewery, I think it was Tetley's at the time, when, he took, when they took it on, and uh, they wanted it to be a bit more welcoming whatever mm -hmm. they didn't seem to understand what welcoming actually means you know there's got to be a heart behind it yeah and uh, they wanted it to be a oh, carpet in the back room mm. and stuff and tom said nope nothing is changing and i think he had a bit of a battle with them at first and i respect him loads i respect both of them for that and they they committed themselves to a place which is not convenient to live in really no. i used to go and teach simon the fiddle when he was a kid i'd go and have me tea and um, uh, give them a lesson, have me tea with them, and then I'd, I'd be playing Tuesday night, I think it was, one, one of my nights yeah. there. And uh, it was pokey. And I got married and my wedding reception was there, and my brother-in-law brought my parents over because they didn't drive. And, and uh, they had a crash on the way over, someone crashed into their car, 
put the damage the lights so they couldn't go back at night tom and barbara put my mum and dad up there you know yeah, yeah. and it must have been cozy that's all i can say <laughs> Tetley's clearly came round to Tom and Barbara's way of thinking in the end, and the back room is still a legendary session space. There's a lovely story about one of the older members of the Tetley family visiting the pub in the 1980s. There happened to be a session in full swing, and a group of Morris dancers were in for a pint after practice. They sang a song about loving Tetley's beer. The visitor asked, are they singing that because of me? And Tom replied, no, why, who are you? The stranger was so gratified at hearing this genuine, spontaneous praise that he arranged for a kilderkin, or a double-sized barrel, of Tetley's to be sent to the pub for free. He then phoned them the week after to thank them personally and make sure the beer had arrived. And that's something else to mention about the history of Fagans, the beer. They're known for their Guinness, but during Tom and Barbara's time, and probably during Joe's as well, they always served a great pint of Tetley's and at least one of the cask ale. They won Sheffield Camera Pub of the Year in 1994, and for a time in the 1980s they served in Coop Burton Ale, which was quite a strong pint. From the late 1990s they served Abidel Moonshine, and more recently, in the 2020s, Timothy Taylor's Landlord. This is all about to change as the new landlords take over in February 2023 with a whole new range of beers. But it would feel wrong to write something about the history of Fagans without mentioning the beer, and also for me the Adelston Cider which they served and I used to drink in the 2000s and could be absolutely lethal. Although in reality it has a very wide and varied clientele, Fagan's is often referred to as an Irish pub, partly because of the traditional music that's played here and the fact that it serves an excellent pint of Guinness. But it has also been an important place for the Irish community in Sheffield over the years. It's one of a group of pubs in this area that tend to be seen as Irish pubs, namely the Dog and Partridge, which was run by Frank and Anne Flynn for many years, the Red House, which is sadly no longer a pub, and Fagan's. The Grapes is now also part of this group, since Anne Flynn took over running it when she left the Dog and Partridge. One of the things that connected them, as well as the music, was the people and the role that the pubs played in the local community. The uh, Dog and Partridge was more on the beaten track, a bit more kind of bright lights in a sense compared to Fagan's. So you got people who'd go for a quiet drink, they'd go down to, to Joe's Boozer and, and have a, a drink down there. And the Red House was the next one over, which was Kathleen and Michael O'Sullivan. And that was a really civilised and nice place. Yeah, you know. So you go and play music. I went in there, they used to give me crates of beer to take mm -hmm. home. <laughs> Don't tell the rest of the people in the session that. <laughs> they say to me, it's gone a bit out of date, but I'm sure you can use it. <laughs> yeah. There was like a community though, it was an Irish community or it had been around that area, I think. I'm not from here so I only know from my encounters but there was those pubs where it was like, I used to call it the Triplet Lane Triangle where you've got all them pubs where you can go from one to the other and you'd get a real warm welcome and it was civilised, you know, they all kept a good house. Since the Red House closed and Anne Flynn moved to the Grapes, the Triangle has shifted but Fagan's is still very much part of it. I spoke to another great musician, singer and bram player Kieran Boyle, about the Irish connection with Fagans. He started playing in Fagans with his dad, Tommy, a wonderful Irish flute player and singer in the 1980s. I used to go when Tom Baldin and Barbara had it in the mid 80s, and I used to go in as a teenager, uh, and it was then uh, like an Irish pub. I used to go in and play with my dad. Dad was a whistle player and a singer and a flute player. And it was a great meeting place for all, uh, mainly Irish people at that time. It was it was a great centre for the place, for the community in, in Sheffield. What was the Irish community like in Sheffield and that bit of Sheffield at the time? Well, it was a sort of uh, very close-knit and people looked after each other. And it, of course, when you imagine that there was still trouble in Ireland, so they had to sort of look after each other uh, and maybe keep a, low, a lower profile to the wider public, so it, it made them a bit more in insular and, and uh, relied on each other. So that would be another reason, and of course, that they'd, they'd take great pleasure in playing the, the tunes and songs that would remind them of home. How could I live on the top of the mountain With no money in my pocket and no gold for the counting I'd let the money go All to gain her fancy I would marry no one but 
My bonny blue eyed Nancy. You'd often you'd find work with you, like my dad was, worked on the roads and things, and people would meet in them places and they say, if you wanted to start on a job, I know somebody who, who can help you out. So there's that type of thing going on. And uh, I've got a, a memory of St. Patrick's Day. Me and Pat Walker was talking about this, probably the, the eight, late 80s, 90s, uh, of, a, of a stream of well-dressed men, big Irish men, going from the, the dog and partridge down to Fagin's and vice versa, going back up to the dog. And you could see them walking up the street and it was, often had brill cream hair. And, and it was, you know, it's sort of a memory I've got of it. And I remember my uncle Frank coming over to visit us from, he was living in Kilkenny at the time and uh, he spent the St. Patrick's Day with us, with us and we went over to Fagin's and had a great afternoon. And it was spe special times, you know, and uh, very, very nice times. Yeah, the Pat St. Patrick's Day at Fagin's is legendary. I mean, I think it's changed now. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, because the, the older generation have sadly receded and passed away, you know, and that, but of course there was people you'd meet there, uh, like like Pat Walker, Nick Farrelly, I met Michael Walsh there, uh, obviously Michael's from Irish parents as well, and, and that was because I think that's probably what attracted them, they knew they'd, 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 they'd meet people there that they'd have things in common with, uh, and so that's how we all came together really. Yeah, someone was telling me that that bunch of pubs so the red house now sadly gone mm. uh the dog fagans was called the irish or the trippet lane triangle <laughs> yeah. but partly a take on the bermuda triangle yeah. which you could get lost there for days <laughs> yeah so we did <laughs> i remember i remember one one afternoon i remember my old mate dick abagan a lovely fella, he lives down in Norfolk now, but Dick used to frequent those Sunday afternoon sessions. And uh, I got, Tom at the time was, was always served great beer and Guinness. And uh, I got drinking this Burton Ale. I was very fond of this Burton Ale. It was so strong. And old Dick had to drop me home because I was so well, <laughs> well on my way. You know, and, oh, and it was very, very Moorish beer. We had a great afternoon of it, but yeah, happy, happy times. <laughs> I love the idea of losing yourself for a while in the Trippet Lane Triangle. Lost, presumed drinking. As well as a place to buy beer, the kindness that's been shown in Fagans over the years was mentioned by lots of people I spoke to, including Gina and another musician and long-term Fagans regular, Trevor Thomas. If you turned up there and you had nothing, you know, Tom offered me money once when I was really desperately hard up. And I, I said, I said thanks, but no, because I, I, I figured I could make some, and it was no strings. It didn't, you know, and that's more than the landlord of a pub, isn't it? Very much so. Well, I've, I've got one of them as well. Um, one time, yeah. when I was very skin, and I'd, I'd come in the pub, and I'd, I used to go in if, if, mm. if I'd like a couple of quid and I'd buy a couple of halves and spin them out, and um, Tom must have clocked this. And he said, um, oh, Trevor, have, have you had your tea? I said, well, no, I haven't. He said, oh, I've got some stuff in there. He might like to try it. He, so, he, you know, he yeah. was giving me something to eat while not making it like he was giving me something to eat. Oh, you might like to try this. And so he gave me a plate with some foil and stuff. I only lived up the road at the time. And um, I, I was really touching, you know, because I, I didn't have any, anything in the house. I was no. quite hungry. And, um I really appreciated it, and um, on the way out, Barbara just said, Trev, just, just make sure you bring the plate back. She says, I've lost a lot of plates. And I thought, this isn't the first time that Tom's done that. And like you say, that's that's more than a pub landlord does. He wrote me a check out, and I said, I can't take it, Tom. And he gave me some tobacco, so I, I was absolutely skinned. I put 50 pence in the blind box or whatever, yeah. and thanked him. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a funny thing. It's it's like dropping in to see your auntie, your favourite auntie, or something like that. It becomes family. Yeah. Interestingly, I found a record of Charles Ledger, the first named landlord of the barrel that I could find in the archives in the eighteen fifties and eighteen sixties, running a ten pound club, where regulars paid a weekly subscription and could then ask for financial support when they most needed it, like an early form of credit union. So again, this story has a resonance going back a long way. I've always felt that the stories of Fagans are part of its fabric, even when they're lost to the mists of time, 
but I've been surprised at just how much continuity there is over the years when you start to look, although there have been some key changes too. As we heard earlier, the building itself has changed and adapted over time, and one very visible change to the pub in recent years has been the huge mural on the outside wall called the Snog, which was painted by Sheffield artist Pete McKee in April 2013. It's become a destination in itself and has certainly put the pub on the map. I had a chat with Pete and asked him about the mural and how it came about. So tell me about the Snog. It was originally conceived for a show that I did that was purely all about Sheffield called The Joyous Chef. And so this featured an old couple kissing. And the joy of chef comes from the joy of sex. And on the front image of that is a, a couple embracing a snog. And I just took that image and transferred it and made it an old Sheffield couple having a big snog. And I wanted to advertise the show and I needed a wall that would show it off to a, you know, a positive audience or whatever. And uh, so I chose Fagan's Pub and the side wall there because it's big and clear and beautiful in sight. And I went into the pub with trepidation and asked Tom if he would mind having a mural on the side of his wall. And before I had finished the sentence, he'd said yes. <laughs> and he didn't even know what the mural was. He didn't care. He just wanted it. And uh, so, yeah, that's so how the snog was born. And it was, it was the first ever wall mural I'd ever done. So I kind of had to make it up as I went along. I was quite fortunate because there's another street artist who no longer lives in Sheffield, but he's a Sheffield street artist called Flem. And his work's international now, it's all over. And I, I bumped into him in the supermarket prior to me painting this mural. And I asked him for advice and asked him what I could do and what, what you need to do. And he sort of basically said, you don't have to use spray paints. You can use any kind of paint you want. So that was great because that meant I just used glorified wall emulsion. And um, I gridded it up in the old uh, old school way that Da Vinci would do and uh, Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel, just grid, grid reference a uh, sketch. And enlarge it so I did that and we hired a, a forklift cherry picker which I'd never driven before a, a, a guy who goes into Fagan's regular offered to store it for us overnight because we only had a weekend to hire this thing out so that was great so we went up to his little factory and picked up the uh, cherry picker and he drove it all the way down the road and up the street past Fagan's and put it into the car park and then me and my uh, son just basically went up and down on this uh, scissor lift, drone it up and I painted it up and we did it in a day. And then initially we were going to start at eight or seven in the morning, but originally I was going to project it on with a large, a large projector just so that I could get the scales right and the projector didn't work. And so then we had to then, I get right, we'll just have to draw it up, grid it up. So I gridded it up and that just took half the day just to do that and then just got cracking on with it. And by the end, by about eight o'clock at night, finished it. All fingers crossed it, it, it turned out all right. It's brilliant, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, I think an awful lot of people love it and it's a yeah. real landmark now. It, well, I think that's the sweet thing about it. I didn't realise it at the time. I don't think I appreciated it at the time that it would have such an impact on the community in, in, in that way. And then quite quickly people were going down and having photographs, replicating the snog and using it for wedding photos and anniversaries and, and stuff. And that's really sweet. And so it, it not only became focal point for people, but it, it, I'm not saying it, it didn't put Fagans on the map, but it just made Fagans that, that you know, it's, oh, Fagans is the one with the big picture on the side of it as well. So it just helped people recognise where the pub was, I guess. Yeah. I just think that uh, it was a nice symbiotic relationship as well, that this couple lived and breathed Fagans as well. And, and I took that on, that the couple themselves, which I've named Frank and Joy, and I did a show a thing called Pub Scroll and did it about four years running and I, t I picked 10 different pubs in Sheffield that would basically make a pub crawl and I got 10 different artists to feature their work in each one and in on one night only everybody went on a pub crawl and got to see art and got to see pubs and Fagan was part of that and then I did a show within Fagan's that day I think it was a Sunday and it's the love story of Frank and Joy and how they met in the Fagan's but it's also a love story about pubs and what they are to a community and how we use pubs to landmark important parts of our lives so whether it be the wedding of a baby's head or an anniversary or to simply meeting up or spending that that stolen afternoon together so it's a it's a two-pronged sort of story one one about this couple and you chart their life from meeting to to the end uh and they all and it's all the same pub that they meet in and they chose but Fagans to be that setting as well as well as having the show in Fagans I used 
the pub itself as the focal point but also like I say it's, it's also a story about how important pubs are to a community and because it was only on for one day I'm now this year going to do the show proper and with, with um, fully paint it up and fully re-show it uh, in, a, in October. Fantastic. So Frank and Joy the love story. Tom has a great story about the pub scroll installation, which included him and Barbara making a 1970s wedding breakfast, complete with cellophane wrapping. And you can find that in with the YouTube videos at Fagan's Stories Sheffield. So again, we're back to people's stories and how their connections to the pub have fundamentally shaped it over the years, which is something we'll explore more over the next few episodes. Before we wrap up this first episode of the Fagan's History podcast, I've got one more story and a song to share with you. I hope you've enjoyed this short dive into some of the early history of the pub. In the next episode, we'll look in a bit more depth at the music sessions in Fagans and some more of the musicians who've performed here over the past 40 years. But I'd like to end with a second story about Albert Fiddler that I promised you earlier on. I came across this story a couple of years ago, again in the British newspaper archive, when I was doing some research for a song walk around the Crofts that I was putting together with my friend and singing partner, Sue Kane. The story was about the theft of a barrel of rum from the backyard of the Barrel Inn in 1911 and it's Sheffield's very own whisky galore, but with rum. The rum ended up in a house on Bailey Lane and when the police followed the smell of rum up Bailey Lane the next morning, they found teapots, pans and even the bathtub full of rum. When the occupants of the house were taken to court, the rum was taken as evidence, which caused great amusement in the local papers who ran with the story, the barrel out, the barrel in. Interestingly, one of the men who was implicated in the barrel theft, although never prosecuted, was Sam Garvin, who ten years later was at the heart of the Sheffield gang wars. Anyway, it's a brilliant story, so I wrote a song about it to sing in the backyard of the pub where the story began. The whole idea behind the song walk was to sing songs and tell stories in the places that they belong, including some of Joseph Mather's songs, which were written to be sung in pubs like Fagan's, words by Ebenezer Elliot and stories relating to Harvey Teasdale. So we sang the barrel in the backyard of Fagan's as part of the song walk during the Sheffield Sessions Festival in 2018 and the story has been up on the wall of the back room ever since. We had shots of rum lined up for everyone in the backyard so the air smelt of rum which added to the atmosphere. And if you want to see a video of us singing the barrel in the backyard there's one on YouTube. Just search Sheffield Song Walks. Anyway, it feels like this is a good place to leave you for now. The first clip you're going to hear is a direct quote from the newspaper article about the court case, which I think is poetry in itself, read by the fabulous Ray Hearn. And that's followed by a live version of the song that I recorded with Kieran when I went to chat to him about his memories of Fagans. Thanks for listening. Do let us know what you think. And if you have any Fagan stories of your own that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. As we're recording this, the pub is on the verge of reopening with new management. So hopefully we might even see you in there for a pint and a song sometime soon. Bye for now. A rum case occupied the attention of the Sheffield Stipendiaries Court yesterday for several hours. It was saturated with rum. Bottles of rum were on and around the solicitor's table and the unfortunate people who were concerned in the inquiry had literally been swamped in rum. It moved the advocates to humour. The stipendiary himself could not resist the temptation and wild comedy held sway in the staid court of justice. On the evening of December the 26th, two mystery men rolled a barrel of rum away from the Barrel Inn licensed house and on their journey to Bailey Lane, the barrel sprung a leak and the first flow began. The mysterious men persevered and the barrel found its way into a house. The rum still leaked. Pans and bottles were utilised. Neighbouring houses were called on for utensil assistance. Rum filled the pansions, ran into the bath and covered the floor and the place reeked with the smell of it. In the barrel up, barrel roll.
boys a fiddle over here And away he cycle toasting with his very own good cheer His very own good cheer In the barrel, out the barrel, roll the barrel round We'll barrel on to Bailey Lane to see what we have found If the barrel's barrel breaks, I'll tell you what we'll do We'll fetch the bath and the saucepans out, we'll call the neighbours too We'll call the neighbours too The next day it was groggy, with neighbours on the floor And we were rudely woken by two coppers at the door podcast was researched and recorded by Tegwen Roberts, Dave Young and Edwin, with thanks to Dave Young as Ebenezer Elliot, Dave Pickersgill, Gina Lafoe, Trevor Thomas, Kieran Boyle and Ray Hearn. It was produced by Steve Dunbobbin. <laughs>